the world's great novels. Alessandro Manzoni said of his own book, The Betrothed, that it seemed sad to him that so pretty a story should remain forever unknown. So he wrote the story some hundred years ago in Italy, and tonight, the NBC University of the Air presents the first installment of a two-part radio edition of The Betrothed, another in the series of books that live, the world's great novels. Not far from a little town near Lake Como in Italy, there ran a number of narrow lanes or mule paths, enclosed by walls that the ancient ivy rendered virgin. Along one of these narrow lanes, on a November evening in the year 1628, Don Abondio, the curate, was leisurely returning home, his lips repeating of their own accord his evening prayers. Raising his eyes, he suddenly saw, barring the path ahead, Two sinister figures, armed with daggers, awaiting him. He saw them exchange glances which plainly expressed, Here's our man. He made a hasty examination to discover whether he'd offended some great man, some vindictive neighbor. But even in his moment of alarm, the consoling testimony of his conscience somewhat reassured him. And then he came up to them. Signor Corrado. Who commands me? You intend to marry Renzo Tramadino to Lucia Mondella tomorrow? Uh, that is... Uh, you gentlemen are men of the world and, and know how these things go. A poor curate has nothing to do with them. They patch up their little treaties between themselves and then... Well, then they come to us as one goes to the bank to make a demand. And uh, we, we are servants of the community. Mark you well. This marriage is not to be performed tomorrow or ever. But, gentlemen, be so kind as to put yourselves in my place. If the thing depended on me, you see plainly it is no advantage to me. Come, come. If the thing were to be decided by prating, you might soon put our heads in a poke. We know nothing about it, and we don't want to know more. A warned man. You understand. Oh, but, gentlemen, you are too just, too reasonable, I am sure. You heard us. The marriage is not to be performed. Or he who performs it will never repent, because he shall have no time to repent. The Signor Curato knows the way of the world, and that we don't wish to do him any harm if he will act like a wise man. Uh, yes, but, gentlemen... What does your reverence wish us to say to our master, the illustrious Signor Don Rodrigo? So that's it. Pray give him my respects. Be more clear, Signor Curat. Disposed, always disposed to obedience. Very well. But above all, let not a word be whispered about this notice that we have given you for your good. <laughs> for it will be the same as marrying them. Good evening, Signor Curat. Uh, but wait. We have said enough, and you have said enough. Do not forget. Don Abundio had not been born with the heart of a lion. From his earliest years, he had learned that an animal without claws and without teeth, which nevertheless wanted to remain alive, must veer with the wind. Yea, he was a vessel of fragile earthenware, obliged to journey in company with many vessels of iron. As he hurried home, he thought, If only that young man Renzo could be dismissed in peace with a mere no, it would be easy. But he will want reasons why I can't marry him. Oh, these young men who fall in love for want of something else to do. Always want to be married and think nothing of other people. So it was that amid the tumult of such thoughts, he reached his own door, hastily entered, and to the surprise of Perpetua, his old and faithful servant, locked it. Mercy! What has happened to you, Master? Uh, nothing, Perpetua, nothing. Some mistake. 
misfortune has happened. Oh, for heaven's sake. When I say nothing, either it is nothing or it is something I cannot tell. But if you do not tell me, who will take care of your safety? Who will advise you? Oh, dear. Hold your tongue. Do you wish me to be obliged to ask here and there what has happened to my master? For heaven's sake, let us have no brawling. Let us have no noise. It is, it is my life. Your life? My life. Senor, I have always been an affectionate servant to you. And if I wish to know what has happened, sir, it is because of my care for you. Perhaps I can help you and give you good advice. Oh, if only you could. But how to stand up against the powerful Senor Don Rodrigo, who threatens to have me killed if I perform the marriage ceremony tomorrow for those poor peasants, the youth Renzo and the pretty Lucia. Don Rodrigo? Oh, what a wretch, what a tyrant, a oh. godless man. Will you hold your tongue? Do you wish to ruin me altogether? Well, we were all alone. No one can hear us. But what will you do, sir? Oh, oh, you see now. You see what good advice this woman can give me. She comes and asks me, what shall I do? What shall I do? As if she were in a quandary and it were my place to help her out. Well, I could give my poor opinion, but then... But then, but then, let us hear. Well... My advice would be that you must tell the Archbishop Cardinal Borromeo. He's a bold-hearted man and will uphold a poor village curato against such a tyrant. And when the dagger is lodged in my back, will the Cardinal dislodge it? At least you can die like a man. I have no intention of dying like a man. So hold your woman's tongue. <laughs> To proceed with the marriage was a plan on which he did not even expend a thought. To confide what had happened to Renzo, the young bridegroom, was out of the question. Suddenly he remembered that it wanted only a few days till Lent, during which weddings were prohibited. If he could put it off till then, he would have two months. And in two months, much could happen. So, when the youth Renzo arrived the following morning... But what has happened, sir? Oh, first of all, my son, I... I do not feel well. I am very sorry. But to marry you, sir, is so soon done and so little fatiguing. And then, and then, well, then... Then uh, what, Signor Curato? There are other difficulties. But what difficulties can there be? My dear son, do you know how many formalities are necessary to perform a marriage regularly? Uh, now, now, don't fly in a passion. <laughs> Alas, when I think of how well off you were until this whim of getting married came upon you. What talk is this, Signor Mio? Have patience for a few days. A few days are not eternity. Have patience. And Lucia? What must I say to her? Uh, that it has been an oversight of mine, and that before concluding the marriage, it is my duty to certify that there is no... Uh, Impediment. And what will all our friends say who have been invited to the wedding? Lay all the fault on me. Tell them I have made a blunder through too much good nature. Now, now, can I say more? Come now, one more week. And after that, then I shall marry you and your pretty Lucia. Very well, Signor. I'll be patient for one more week, but not for longer. <laughs> Leaving with a heavy heart, Renzo could not help but sense that some mystery lay behind the priest's conduct. The youth was on the point of turning back to oblige him to speak more plainly when he saw Perpetua a little way before him entering the garden. Good morning, Perpetua. I had hoped we should all be happy today. As heaven wills, my poor Renzo. Explain to me better why the Signor Curato cannot or will not marry us today. Is it likely I know my master's secrets? All I say is that it's a bad thing to be born poor, my dear Renzo. Is it for a priest to bear hardly with the poor? If he does wrong, it is because of some wretches in this world. Huh? Overbearing tyrants, men without the fear of God. Oh. Wait, where are you going? I'm going back. Wait, now I've said nothing, even on the rack. Nothing would come from my mouth. Wait, Renzo, wait. 
Now I have you. Eh? Who? What new thing is this? Who is this tyrant who is unwilling that I should marry Lucia? What? What is that? Now, ah, Perbacco, everybody knows my affairs except myself. What is his name? I will know it. Who has told you? No more trickery now. Speak. Do you wish me to be killed? I wish to know what I have a right to know. But if I speak, I'm a dead man. Surely I'm not to trample out my own life. Then speak. <sighs> promise never to tell. I promise to do an ill deed if you don't tell me at once. It, it is Don Rodrigo. Oh, the dog! How has he done it? To force from my lips my own ruin. And yours, that I tried to conceal from you in prudence for your own good. Well, put your hand to your heart and think whether in my case... And now that you know how much wiser are you, except to know that ruin hangs over us. Ruin, my son! Renzo hurried home without knowing what he would do, but with a mad longing to do something strange and terrible. This overbearing act of Don Rodrigo could have no motive but a lawless passion for Lucia. The youth's heart panted for murder, but he remembered that Don Rodrigo's home was a fortress guarded within and without, and that he himself was but a poor and powerless peasant. He ran the last few steps to Lucia's home and sought her. Lucia! Lucia, oh, it is all up for today, and God knows when we can be married. What? Oh, has it come to this point? Then you know it? Oh, indeed, too well. But to this point. What do you know about it? Oh, wait, here comes your mother. For oh, shame, Renzo. Making Lucia cry on her wedding day. Don Rodrigo has stopped our wedding. Don Rodrigo? Yes. But he doesn't even know my daughter. Well, yes. Last week. He and another gentleman on the way home from the spinning. They tried to speak to me, but I didn't answer, but hurried on. And I heard them say one to the other. I'll lay you a wager. And then they laughed. Oh, the wretch! The murderer! This is the last deed that assassin shall do. No, no. God is on the side of the poor. How can we expect him to help us if we do wrong ourselves? Let us go far off so that this man will hear no more about us. But we are not yet man and wife. And the Kurato refuses to marry us. Oh, there must be justice somewhere. In their despair, they turned to Father Cristoforo, a Capuchin monk, who, although under the law he could not marry them, yet declared that he would go and reason with Don Rodrigo. Well, how can I obey you, Father Cristoforo? I come to propose to you an act of justice and to supplicate a deed of mercy. Don't you know that when fancy takes me to hear a sermon, I can go to church like other people? I am concerned for an innocent young girl, but not more for her than for you, Don Rodrigo. Well, since you seem to think I can do so much for this person... One word from you, Don Rodrigo, will do all. Well, advise her to come here, Father, and put herself under my protection. Under... She shall want for nothing, as I am a gentleman. Under your protection? Certainly. Woe be unto you that you make me such a proposal. You fill up the measure of your iniquity... And I no longer fear you. How are you speaking to me, Father? I speak to you as one who is forsaken by God. You are droll, Friar. You will see whether the justice of God can be restricted by the walls of your castle and your four guards at the gate. Think you that God has made a creature in his image to give you the delight of tormenting her? How dare you threaten me? The heart of Pharaoh was hardened like yours. But God knew how to break it. Lucia is safe from you. I do not hesitate to say so, though a poor friar. And as for you, listen what I predict to you. A day will soon come... Get out of my sight, you cold rascal! I will get out of it. But a curse is suspended above you. Fearing the designs of the nobleman... 
Father Cristoforo arranged that Lucia should seek sanctuary in a famous convent far to the south. And that same night she left. As for the youth Renzo, the village was no longer safe for him. And he left for Milan, torn at heart, but sustained by the forlorn hope that, in God's good time, he and Lucia would yet become man and wife. Meanwhile, Don Rodrigo, whose passion for Lucia became even more inflamed now that she seemed beyond his grasp, determined to seek the help of a certain notorious nobleman, Count Rivola. Rivola was not only a man superior to most in riches, retinue, and intrepidity, but he was a man who had secured himself by the force of crime, a man who led an independent life on the confines of his estate in an impregnable castle. To do what was forbidden was with him a passion. He felt that to draw back from Don Rodrigo's petition to kidnap Lucia from the convent was for him to forfeit his deadly reputation. <coughs> Thus she was kidnapped by one of Count Rivola's assassins, a man named Nebio, who, having seen she was secured in one of the rooms of the gloomy castle, came to render his report. Well, Nebio? Everything went exactly right. The girl was in the garden, and we caught her. Only two screams, and nobody attracted by them. The coach was ready, and the horses swift, and nobody met with it. Uh, but, uh, well... But what? But I would rather have had to stab her in the back without hearing her speak, without seeing her face. What do you mean? Uh, I mean, sir, that I feel too much compassion for her. You, Nibio? Yes, Count. You who have killed how many? Uh, I've never kept a reckoning. You who are my right hand? You? Yes. Compassion. What do you know of compassion? What is this compassion? It is something like fear. Once it takes possession of you, you are no longer a man. You know, Nebio, you become very interesting. You excite my curiosity. Let me hear a little of what she did to arouse your compassion. Weeping and praying. And her eyes. <laughs> Get out of my sight with all your softness. Yes, no, Signor. Left alone, Count Rivola, the supreme criminal, stood with his gaze fixed upon a spot on the floor where the moonlight entering through a lofty window traced out a square of pale light. He thought, well, that girl must have some angel to protect her. Compassion and Nebio. And who is this peasant girl that an animal like Don Rodrigo burns up for? Compassion and Nebio. Very well, I shall see for myself. Hastening through the castle, he ascended a long flight of stone stairs to the south tower. He knocked on the door for the old woman in whose charge he had arranged Lucia to be left. Who is it? Who is there? Open that door. Oh, yes, master. Right away. Where is she? There, in the corner, master. Who bid you throw her there like a bag of rags, you uncivil old beldam? She chose it herself. I've done my best to encourage her. She can tell you so herself, but she won't mind me. Get up. Get up. I'll do you no harm, and I can do you some good. Get up! Here I am. Kill me if you will. I've told you I'll do you no harm. Courage, courage. If he himself tells you he will do you no harm, then why make me suffer the agonies of hell? What have I done to you? Perhaps they've treated you badly. Tell me. Treated me badly? They have seized me by treachery, by force. Why? Why am I here? I'm a poor, harmless girl. In the name of God... <sighs> They who cannot defend themselves, who have not the strength to do it, must always bring forward God. What do you expect by this word? Oh, senor, what can a poor girl like me expect, except that you should have mercy upon me? God pardons so many sins for one deed of mercy. Let me go. For charity's sake, let me go. Bid them take me to a church. 
I will pray for you all my life. Come, take courage. Have I done you any harm? Have I threatened you? Oh, no. I see that you have a kind heart and feel some pity for an unhappy creature. God will reward you for it. Finish your deed of mercy. Set me free. Set me free. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'll see you again. Come, in the meantime, be of good courage. You, old woman! Yes, Your Honor. Persuade her to eat something and let her lie down in the bed to rest. Encourage her, I say, and keep her cheerful. Beware that she has no cause to complain of you. Yes, Your Grace. Departing from Lucia, Count Rivola hastily retired to his chamber, and the image of her face seemed to haunt his mind. Seemed to say, Thou shalt not sleep. That fool of a baby was right. One is no longer a man. Am I no longer a man? What has happened? What is there new in all this? The devil has got possession of me. Didn't I know before now that women always weep and implore for mercy? Hey, but men do that sometimes when they've not the power to rebel. Have I never heard women cry before? And yet... Yet she is here, and there's yet time. I can yet say to her, go and be happy. Can yet see her beautiful face change. I can even say, forgive me. I ask forgiveness, and of a peasant girl? Away. These are fooleries which have many times passed through my mind. These two will take flight. But they did not take flight. On the contrary, they grew more intense. And backward, from year to year, from bloodshed to bloodshed, from crime to crime, Count Rivola traced his life in all its monstrousness. And while he was thus drearily engaged, above him in the room of her captivity, Lucia was on her knees in fervent prayer. Oh, most holy virgin... Thou to whom I have so often recommended myself and who hast so often comforted me. Thou who hast borne so many sorrows and art now so glorious. Thou who hast wrought so many miracles for the poor and afflicted. Help me. Bring me out of this danger. Bring me safely to my mother, O oh mother of our Lord. And I vow unto thee to continue a virgin. I renounce forever my unfortunate betrothed, that from henceforth I may belong only to thee. And so the long night passed. And then at dawn, Count Rivola heard the distant chiming of bells. And from his window, he could see a throng of people hastening into the village at the bottom of the valley. Upon inquiry... He learned that Cardinal Borromeo, Archbishop of Milan, had arrived that morning. All this gladness because of one man? Everybody joyful at the sight of him? What has this man about him to make so many people happy? Some money, perhaps, that he'll distribute at random among them. But they, they can't all be going for arms. Perhaps he'll say to them a consoling word or two. Oh, or if he only had words for me... Words that might bring me peace. If... Why shouldn't I go too? Why not? I will go to talk to him. Entering the village, Count Rivola found the crowd assembled outside the curate's house. Look. The Count's name spread through the throng like a chill, and they fell back so anxious to get beyond his very reach. This man, this notorious character, wished to see the cardinal... What is it, Federico? A strange visitor, my noble lord. Strange indeed. Who? No less a personage than Count Rivola. Let him come in directly. But, Your Grace, surely you must be aware who he is. An outlaw, the most infamous man in all Italy. And is it not, therefore, a most happy circumstance that such a man should feel a wish to come and seek me? But he is a desperate and dangerous character. Let him be admitted directly. He has already waited too long. Yes, my noble lord. 
You may come in now, Count Rivola. Yes. What a welcome visit is this. And how thankful I am to you for coming, even though it brings me reproof. Reproof? Yes. For allowing you to come to me, when so often and for so long a time, I might and ought to have come to you myself. You come to me? Do you know who I am? Did they deliver in my name rightly? You are Count Rivo. And there is no one I would have desired more to receive an embrace if I had thought I might hope for such a thing. Well, you have good news to tell me, and you keep me so long expecting. Good news? I have hell in my heart. What good news can you expect from such as I am? That God has touched your heart and would make you his own. God. If I could see him, if I could hear him, where is this God? You ask that. Do you not feel him in your very heart? Agitating you, never leaving you at ease, yet drawing you forward, presenting to your view a hope of tranquility and consolation. Oh, surely there is something within me that oppresses and consumes me. But if this be God, and if he is such as they say, what can God do with me? The world has long cried out against you. But when you yourself rise up to condemn your own past, that indeed God will be glorified. What can God do with you? Pardon you. Save you. Finish in you the work of redemption. If it were only true. It is true. And you must suffer me to press your hand which will repair so many wrongs and dispense so many benefits. May God forgive me. He is infinite in his mercy. Great and good God. What have I done that I should make me worthy of being an instrument in so joyful a miracle? Yes, now I understand what I am, and I shudder at myself. And yet, God is indeed great. God is indeed good. For I feel a joy such as I've never known before. You bring great joy to me also. How many wrongs I have committed for which now I can but mourn. Yet there is one which I can break off in its very midst. What is that, my son? A young girl I've kidnapped, who's being held in my castle to be given to another. Now you are indeed blessed. For God makes you capable of becoming the instrument of safety, the one whom you intended to do. Thus it was that Lucia, by a miracle of God, found herself set free. But other and more terrible dangers lay in the path ahead of her, menacing both herself and her betrothed, the youth Renzo. Next week we shall see how they were to achieve the destiny that awaited them. Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni is one of the world's great novels, brought to you each week by the NBC University of the Air. Listen next week to the final episode of The Betrothed, and remember that this and countless other great books are to be had in your local public library. Herbert Gorman's handbook of the world's great novels is a valuable aid to the enjoyment of these broadcasts. Just send 25 cents with your request to World's Great Novels, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. That's Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27. The Betrothed is adapted for radio by Frederick Schlick. The music composed by Emil Soderstrom, the orchestra directed by Bernard Berkowitz. The entire production is under the direction of Homer Heck. Bob McKee was the narrator. Rianzo was played by Charles Mountain. Lucia by Joyce McCluskey. Abondio by Arthur Peterson. Perpetua by Geraldine Kay. Cristoforo by George Pugge. Con Rivolo by Duke Watson, the Cardinal by Philip Lord, Rodrigo by Tony Perez, and Yese by Hilda Graham, Federico by Cliff Norton, and Nibio by Harlan Ensley. This is David Garraway. The program has come to you from Chicago and is a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its independent affiliated station. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The world's 
great novel. The NBC University of the Air presents the second installment of a two-part radio edition of Alessandro Manzoni's novel of 17th century Italy, The Betroth, the story of the love of the youth Renzo for the pretty Lucia, another in the series of Books That Live, the world's great novel. In the first episode, we saw how Renzo and Lucia, prevented from being married by the evil designs of Don Rodrigo, were forced to flee from their native village in Italy. Then, kidnapped, Lucia was freed by a miracle in which God touched the heart of Count Rivola, her captor. In 1628, the year of our story, Italy was invaded by German troops and so soon found herself being ravished by the dreaded plague. Sickness and death began rapidly to multiply, and in the city of Milan, among others, the dead could be seen scattered here and there. On the streets or in doorways or lying in heaps, making the whole city like one immense sepulcher. Renzo also took the plague, but he cured himself. That is to say, he did nothing. He was at the point of death, but his good constitution conquered the strength of the malady. And in a few weeks, he was out of danger. And with the return of life, its cares, its wishes, hopes, recollections, and designs were renewed with double poignancy and vigor, which is to say that he thought more than ever of his beloved Lucia. But they had lost track of each other's whereabouts. What had become of her? Where was she? Did she still live? To remain in this state of uncertainty is unbearable. I must find her. Oh, if she lives, I'll find her. That I will. And if she is dead... If she is dead... Leaving Milan, Renzo at last managed to return to his own village, from which some 20 months before he had fled in despair. During the bread riots in Milan just before the Great Plague... Renzo had, though completely innocent, become involved in one of the disturbances and been arrested. With the aid of the mob, he had escaped, but not before he'd been recognized. A warrant was issued for his arrest and circulated through the district. Thus, when he reached his own village, he was almost a fugitive, though the plague had done much to remove the danger of his situation. It was evening as he arrived, and turning a corner in the road... He came face to face with his old curate, Don Abundio. Are you here? You? I am indeed, Signor Corrado. Do you know anything of Lucia? Oh, what do you suppose I can know? I know nothing. And her but mother, you... Agnesa? Is she alive? She may be, but who do you suppose can tell? She's not here. Where is she? But she's gone to live at Valsicina among her relations at Pastoro, you know. For they say the plague doesn't make the havoc there, it does here. Oh, I'm very but sorry. You... And Father Cristoforo? He's been gone for some time. I know that. But... They wrote and told me as much. But I want to know if he has returned to these parts. Nay, they've heard nothing further about him. Oh, but I'm very you... sorry to hear this, But too. you, I say, what for heaven's sake are you coming to do in this part of the world? Don't you know about this affair of your arrest? What does it matter now? The plague has given them something else to think about. And most of them are dead anyway by now. I was determined to come for once and see about my affairs. And what would you see about, I wonder? For now there's no longer anybody or anything. And is it wise of you, with that business of your arrest, to come hither exactly to your own village, into the wolf's very mouth? Ah. Do as an old man advises you. Buckle on your shoes well and set off before anyone sees you. Ah. Do you think this is the air for you? Don't you know they've been to look for you? They've ransacked everything and, and turned all upside down. I know it too well, the scoundrel. But then But you... I tell you, I don't care. And is that rascal Don Rodrigo alive yet? Is he here? I tell you, nobody's here. I, I tell you, you mustn't think about things here. I, I ask if you... Don Rodrigo's here. Oh, secret heavens, speak more quietly. 
Is it possible you've all that fieriness about you after so many things have happened? Is he here or is he not? Well, well, he's here. Oh. But the plague, my son, the plague... Who would go traveling about in such times as these? Uh, if there was nothing else but the plague in this world. I mean, for myself, I've had it and am free. Indeed, indeed. What news is this? When one has escaped the danger of this sort, it, it seems to me he should thank heaven. And, and so I do. Uh, and not go to look for others, I say. Uh, do as I advise. You've had it too, Signor Corato, if I mistake not. Uh, I had it, I had it. Obstinate and bad enough it was, I... I'm here by miracle. Now I had need of just a little quiet to set me to rights again. I, I was beginning to be a little better. In, in the name of heaven, what have you come to do here? Go back. You're always at me with that go back? Yes. As for going back, I have reasons enough for not stirring. You say, what do you come for? What do you come for? I've come home. Home? But don't be afraid. I've no intentions of stopping here. Oh, thank heaven you at last understand. And you'd better make up your mind to return. That is my business. I'm more than seven years old. <laughs> I hope at any rate you won't tell anyone you've seen me. You are a priest. I am one of your flock. You won't betray me. I understand. I understand. <laughs> you would ruin yourself and me too. You haven't gone through enough already, I suppose. And I haven't gone through enough either. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Muttering, fearful and peevish. Don Abondio, the village priest, left poor Renzo, who stood chagrined and discontented, wondering where he could find a lodging. Thinking over the list of his erstwhile friends, he remembered one Tonio and immediately made his way to where Tonio lived. It was twilight, and Tonio was seated outside his house alone. Hearing a footstep, he turned around and called out through the leaves and branches, Is there nobody but me? Didn't I do enough yesterday? Let me alone a little. For well, that, too, will be a work of charity. Tonio! It is I, Renzo. Don't you know me? Renzo? Yes, Tonio, my friend. Is it really you? Yes. Oh, how glad I am to see you. Oh, who would have thought it? I took you for one of the friars of the Order of Death, who is always coming to torment me to go and bury someone dead of the plague. Uh, do you know I am left alone? Alone? Alone as a hermit. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it, Tonio. These are bad times. There is much sadness. Uh, but come into the house, Renzo. Oh, it is good to see you again. Come in and let me fix you something to eat while you tell me how it is with you. Uh, I have been through much. I've had the plague uh... and recovered, as you can see. But now, please tell me if you have any news of my Lucia. Lucia? Why could I know of her? She has not been seen here for... But oh. surely you have heard something. Tell me anything you may have heard, no matter how small. Well, some days ago I did hear that she was in Milan. Oh. And that she is looking for you. Oh, Milan, but I have just come from there. Oh, what a pity you couldn't have known. Oh, I must go back, Tonio. Oh, but surely not tonight, Renzo. It's late. You are tired. I am tired, yes, and Milan is far. But I shall never rest until I find Lucia. If I find her alive, I will return. But if I do not, which God forbid, then you will never see me again. Every tree under which I had once sat with Lucia would be too sad. His friend Tonio tried to comfort him with bright hopes and making him take with him some food, accompanied him a mile or two on his way, bidding him goodbye and telling him to inquire after his cousin in Milan who might know of Lucia. Meanwhile, unknown to Renzo, his arch-enemy Don Rodrigo had left his castle and gone to his residence in Milan, attended by his paid bodyguard, the outlaw Griso. One night soon after that, returning from a company of friends, he felt a languor, and an inward burning fever. Grito? Yes, yes, Don Rodrigo. Light the lamps here in my room. Yes, 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 Your, Your Excellency. Well, now what are you looking at? I am looking at you, Your Honor. I'm in good health, as you see. It's only that I've taken perhaps a little too much wine to drink. That is all. But your face seems oddly heated, Signor. What of it? 
That's from too much wine. Well, this late hour of even the season. Good night's sleep, and it will go off. Yes. Sleep will do us all good, Your Honor. Certainly. If I can sleep. After all, I am well enough. Yet this... This humming in my ears. What is that? This fire blazing within me. Fire? Something paining me here on my left side. A pain, Your Excellency? Yes. Bring the light closer. Let me look. (gasps) Greta, look... I am looking, Your Honor. This hideous spot on my side, livid purple. Don Rodrigo, that is the pestilence you have. (gasps) If anyone hears of it, they will carry me off and throw me into the lazaretto with all the other dead and dying. I, Don Rodrigo, in a pest house, never... Grito, you have always been my trusted friend. Yes. Senor. I have always dealt well by you. Now I am ill. I had perceived that. Listen, Briso. If I recover, I swear I will heap upon you more favors than ever before. But now, now I dare not trust myself to anyone <laughs> but you. Briso, what are you doing there? What am I doing here, Your Honor? I am about to break open the lock on this chest here. Why, you infamous traitor, you you mean to rob me? Rob you? Can we call it that, Your Excellency? You will be dead shortly and quite unable to use money, whereas I, your faithful Grizo, can use it nicely. Look, it is beautiful. Listen. You scoundrel, Uh, I can still recover. You are frantic, Your Honor. You who have tormented so many and paid me to do it for you, now you are afraid to die. That's a lie. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> I must live. You are dying. And that little peasant girl, Lucia, who made your mouth water, now you will never possess her. Water? I'm parched the thirst. I can bear it no longer. Give me a drop of water. A waste of my valuable time, senor. And now I shall leave you, your magnificent excellency. Dog! But before leaving, with your money, allow me to tell you that you are neither magnificent nor excellent. Vileless traitor! <laughs> it does my kind heart good to see you there, already half dying. <laughs> well, goodbye, your magnificence. <laughs> <laughs> But let us return to the young Renzo. After a long search, he at last found Tonio's cousin in Milan, from whom he hoped to learn more of Lucia's whereabouts. She was here in this very house. Here, signor? Yes, but she is here no longer. Uh, Now, if you'll excuse me... One moment, for pity's sake. She's no longer here, then where is she? At the Lazzaretto. The Lazzaretto? You mean with the best of... Those who have it must go there, mustn't they? Now, I must ask you to leave. I'm a very busy man. One more word for charity. Was she... Was she very ill? Yes, 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 of course. Everyone who has it is very ill and thousands die of it. Uh, Step out, please, through the door. Yes, senor. But tell me, how long ago was it? What difference does that make? If she is alive, she is alive. And if she's dead, she's dead. And nothing you can say or that I can say can change that. Goodbye. But, senor, one more question. Tell me if... But Renzo might as well have asked the very wall, for there was no reply. Anguished, he found his way to the enclosure of the Lazzaretto peopled with 16,000 persons ill of the plague, crowded with the dead or dying stretched upon mattresses of bare straw. It was like the swell of the sea, people coming and going, some sinking under disease, others rising from their sick beds, either convalescent, frantic, or to attend upon others. Such was the spectacle that unfolded to Renzo's view, and he paused horror-struck and overpowered Controlling himself, he began his search, threading his way amongst them, gazing upon their faces, contracted by spasms of suffering, 
or motionless in death. Hours passed. Then, suddenly ahead of him, he saw a Capuchin monk making the sign of the cross over one of the dying. Father Cristoforo. Uh, you here? How are you, Father? How are you? Better than the many poor creatures you see. But you, Renzo, how is it that you are in this place? What makes you come thus to brave the pestilence? Oh, I've had it, thank heaven. But even if I had not, I would come, for I am seeking Lucia. Lucia? Is Lucia here? Yes. At least I hope in God that she may still be here. Is she your wife? My wife? No. No, that she is not. Alas. Tell me about our poor little Lucia. Through you, Father, she found haven at the convent. But from there she was kidnapped. Kidnapped? By the notorious Count Rivola. And then by a miracle of God he became devout and saved her and released her. And since then she has been looking for me. And here I am to look for her. My son, it is much that you come here to ask. A person alive within the Lazaretto. Do you know how many I have seen carried off and how few go out recovered? So, my son, continue your search, but be prepared for what you may find. I shall look from top to bottom of the Lazaretto. And if I don't find her... If you don't find her, my son? If I don't find her, then I shall know where to find somebody else. A man who hides from the plague in his castle but cannot hide from me. My son. I shall find him and I shall get justice. Look about you, miserable man. See who is he that chastises. Who is he that judges and is not judged. He that scourges and forgives. And you, you would be the judge. I had hoped that before my own death, God would have given me the comfort of hearing that Lucia was alive. Perhaps of hearing that her promise that she would send one prayer to the grave where I shall soon be laid. Now you rob me of this hope. Now go. I've no longer time to listen to you. Father, don't send me away like this. What? Dare you require that I should steal the time from these afflicted ones who are waiting for me to speak to them of the pardon of God? To listen to your words of fury and revenge? What have I to do with you? Be gone. Father, I forgive Don Rodrigo. I forgive him indeed, and, and forever. My son, my son. Know you why I am a Capuchin monk? Tell me, Father. Because I too hate it. And that man whom I so long hated, I murdered. Then he was a tyrant and you had reason. Hush. Think you that if there were a good reason for it, that I shouldn't have found it in thirty years? Oh, if I could but instill into your heart the love I now have for the man whom I once hated. But God can, and may he do so. Listen, Renzo. Did you think that God would let you take vengeance upon a man whom he created in his own image? No, Renzo. Such a temper of mind as yours may deprive you of every blessing. Rest assured that you will be punished until you have forgiven. Forgiven in such a way that you may never again be able to say, I forgive him. Hate and you will be lost forever. Love and let God be judge. Yes, yes, Father. I see that I have spoken like a beast and not like a Christian. By the grace of God, I will forgive him. I'll forgive him from my very heart. And supposing you someday meet him, will you still forgive him? With God's help, I will, Father. Come with me, my son. Taking Renzo's hand, he led the youth through the crowd until they came to the door of a miserable hut. Entering... Renzo beheld four of the ill lying upon straw. As he gazed at them, he suddenly recognized his enemy, Don Rodrigo. And he would have thought him a corpse had not convulsive twitchings revealed the tenacity of life. There he is, my son. Bless him and be blessed. Oh, God forgive him. And now go and seek for Lucia. 
And however you find her, bless God and accept his reckoning. Then return to me. Once again, Renzo resumed his terrible search for Lucia. All that day, and the next, he'd almost given up hope. When he found her, he found her, and she was attending one of the ill. Lucia, I found you. Renzo, oh. wait. Oh, you must go. Play. Oh, but I've had it. Oh, and I too. But, oh, Renzo, why are you here? Why am I here? Am I no longer Renzo? Are you no longer Lucia? Renzo, forgive me, but when I was held captive by Count Rivola, I promised Madonna that if I were saved, I would give up the world, everything, and go into a convent. After your promise to me? Oh, are we no longer ourselves? Don't you any longer remember? I was beginning to hope that in time you would forget me. Fine thing to tell me to my face. No, no, Lucia. We must pray to God for those who are dying. But they who live should not be doomed to live in despair. Yes, but Renzo, a promise to the Madonna, a vow. And I tell you that yours is a promise that counts for nothing. You know not what you are saying. Yes. Don't you know what you ought to promise the Madonna? Promise her that the first daughter we have will name Maria. For that I am willing to promise also. That does honor to the Madonna and no harm to anyone. You don't know what it is to make a vow. Lucia, tell me just one thing. If there were not this reason, would you feel the same to me as ever? You are heartless. You know very well that I... With all my heart... Oh, no. Please, Renzo. It is no use. Listen, Lucia... Father Cristoforo is here. Maybe... Father Cristoforo? Where? How do you know? Oh, I've seen him and spoken with him just a little while ago. Has he had the plague? Oh, Lucia, I'm sadly afraid that he has it now. Oh, poor man. Lucia, I do not believe you would approve of this vow of yours that you made up out of your own head without advice from anyone. I'm going to bring him here and let him tell you how mistaken you are. Go to that holy man and tell him that I pray for him and ask him to do so for me. But for heaven's sake, for your own soul's sake and mine, never come back here to tempt me again. He left her to hasten back to Father Cristoforo, whom he found administering consolation to a dying man. Renzo drew back, waited in silence. In a few moments, he saw the monk close the man's eyes, pray, then rise feebly. Renzo hurried forward to meet him. Well, my son? She's here. I found her. In what condition? Recovered. The Lord be praised. Oh, but there's another difficulty, Father. What do you mean? I mean that after all her promises to me and... Well, after we were torn apart, she was captured by Count Rivola. And in terror, when she prayed for rescue, she made a vow of chastity to the Madonna. Is she very far from here? Just beyond the church there. Come, we will go together. You mean you'll give her to understand... I know nothing about it, my son. First, I must hear what she has to say to me. They set off without further words. Renzo's heart was full of uneasy expectations as he compelled himself to slacken his pace to accommodate the feeble gait of Father Cristoforo. At last, they rejoined Lucia. Father Cristoforo? Oh! Well, Lucia, from how many troubles has the Lord delivered thee? Oh, but you, Father, you are ill. No, no, as God wills. Lucia, are you inclined to confide in me as you have always done hitherto? Oh, are you not always my father? Then, my daughter, what is this vow that Renzo has been telling me about? It is a vow I made to the Madonna to give up the things of the world, even marriage, if she would save me from Count Rivola. And she saved me. I understand. But did you not recollect at the time that you were already bound by another promise? No. Not when it was related to the Madonna. I see. My daughter, the Lord approves of sacrifices when we make them of our own. Because it is the heart that he desires. And yet, you could not offer him the heart of another also, to whom you had already pledged yourself. 
Have I done wrong? No, 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 my poor child. I believe the Holy Virgin will have accepted the intention of your afflicted soul and have presented it to God for you. But tell me, did you consult anyone about this? No, Father. So, have you any other motive that hinders you from fulfilling the promise you made to Lorenzo? No, no, Father, nothing. But is it not a sin to turn back and, and repent of a promise made to the Madonna? Oh, Be quiet, my son. A sin, my daughter? A sin to have recourse to the church and to ask me, her minister, to make use of the authority which the church has received from God? I bless him that he has given me the power to speak in his name and to return to you your plighted word. And if you request me to declare you absolved from this vow, I shall not hesitate to do it. Nay, I wish that you so request me. Then, then I do request you. Then return in peace to your former desires and beseech the Lord again for those graces you once besought to make you a holy wife and rely upon it that he will bestow them upon you more abundantly after so many sorrows. Lucia, love each other as companions on a journey with the thought that you will have to part from one another and with the hope of being reunited forever. Yes, Father. And Lucia. Yes, Father. When... when I am gone. Pray for me. They parted from Father Cristoforo with deep sadness. But youth and love will prevail, and at last the blessed day arrived. Lucia and Renzo, as bride and groom, went to their own village church, where Don Abondio himself finally declared them man and wife. Not long after, they went to live in another part of Italy, where they prospered greatly. And before the first year of their marriage was completed, a beautiful little creature was born. And as if it had been made on purpose to give Renzo an early opportunity of fulfilling that promise of his, it was a little girl. You may be sure that it was named Maria. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni is one of the world's great novels. Brought to you each week by the NBC University of the Air. Listen next week to the first episode of The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. And remember that these and countless other great books are to be had in your local public library. Herbert Gorman's Handbook of the World's Great Novel is a valuable aid to enjoyment of these broadcasts. Just send 25 cents with your request to World's Great Novels, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. That's Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27. The Betroth was adapted for radio by Frederick Schlick. The music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and the orchestra was directed by Bernard Berquist. The entire production was under the direction of Homer Heck. Bob McKee was the narrator. Renzo was played by Charles Mountain. Lucia by Joyce McCluskey, Abandillo by Arthur Peterson, Christophero by George Kugi, Don Rodrigo by Tony Parrish, Griso by Sherman Marks, Tonio by Ken Nordine, and The Cousin by Ted List. This is John Conrad. This program comes to you from Chicago and is a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its independent affiliated station. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.